Hello, welcome to the Friday, August 14th, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Researchers from the Ruhr University in Bochum and the New York University of Abu Dhabi came up with an interesting attack to decrypt LTE voice calls. When you're using a cell phone to make a call over LTE, a stream cipher is being used to encrypt the data. And in order for this stream cipher to provide good security, a new key stream, which means a new set of bytes has to be selected for each call in order to guarantee the confidentiality of this call. Now, the technique being developed by these researchers forces a reuse of a key stream. And with that, calls may be able to decrypt it. They call the attack re-vo-LTE, so essentially re-voice over LTE, and publish the paper outlining how the attack works. Now, this is not a problem with the standard of voice over LTE, but an implementation issue. And they actually worked with the standard bodies to make sure that carriers were able to fix the problem before the paper was released. The problem that the paper outlines is that vulnerable base stations, which means essentially the cell phone towers, will reuse keys if two calls are being made using the same radio connection. So essentially immediately following each other. And the way this would be attacked is that an attacker observes a call being made from a handset to a certain tower. Once that call ends, the attacker will immediately call the victim. And then that key stream will be reused. And of course, the attacker will know the plain text content of the second call and will be able to use it to derive the key stream, which since it's the same one as for the first call can then be used to decrypt the first call. At the time when this particular vulnerability was discovered, the researchers took a look at 15 different cell phone towers in Germany and found that 13 of them were misconfigured and were vulnerable to this particular exploit. Since this is really a problem with uh, the tower, the base station, there's really not much that you can or have to do as an end user. They did release an Android application that can detect if a cell phone tower that you are connecting to is vulnerable. However, uh, this Android application only works if you have root access to your phone and if your phone uses a Qualcomm chipset. So in the end, it's up to the carriers to make sure that their base stations are properly configured. And hopefully due to the coordinate vulnerabilities closure that these researchers did back in December, this should hopefully be taken care of by now. The only sort of countermeasure that I could think of as a user is that if you just made a confidential call and all of a sudden immediately after that call receive an incoming call from an unknown number out of the blue, well, it may be better not to pick up. And Checkpoint Research did release yet another interesting blog post, this time looking at vulnerabilities in Amazon's Alexa that Amazon recently patched. The problem here is that these vulnerabilities could be used to replace applications, these so-called skills within Amazon Alexa. And as a result, an attacker could override a certain skill with a very common invocation phrase. Each skill does have a particular phrase in order to start the command, like whether or not you want to, for example, turn on your lights or whatever you want to do with that particular skill. But these invocation phrases are not necessarily unique. So different developers may offer different skills that use the same invocation phrase. The reason this was exploitable was that Amazon didn't carefully enough separate 
origins within its web services that are being used for Amazon Alexa. The origin is usually identifying the host name, the protocol and the port of a particular request. And cross origin policies are used to keep different origins apart. The problem with Amazon Alexa was that for any JavaScript or such that would be used to send requests back to Amazon, the only thing that was enforced was the Amazon.com part. So an attacker could inject JavaScript at any other Amazon.com site. So all it took was a single cross-site scripting vulnerability anywhere within the Amazon.com universe. To turn this into an exploit, a user would have to click on a link that will direct the user to amazon.com, then use this cross-site scripting vulnerability at amazon.com to load JavaScript into the user's browser due to the loose course policy. It was then a possible for this JavaScript to send a request to Amazon and retrieve a cross-site request forging token from Amazon and exfiltrate it to the attacker. The attacker can then use uh, this token to uninstall the existing application or skill from Amazon's Alexa and install instead the replacement skill with the identical phrase. And the next time you ask Alexa to turn on your lights, well, uh, maybe all the lights in your house go off or the doors open or whatever uh, the attacker would like you to do. So somewhat complex exploit, but probably in reality, it would not have been that tif difficult to pull this off. Uh, Amazon, of course, has patched this vulnerability. Amazon Alexa will update firmware automatically, so nothing that you have to do. And of course, power to fixes here were on Amazon's backend. And if you're managing Linux servers, you may want to take a look at a document released by the NSA together with the FBI with details regarding the Trovorup uh, malware. This malware is a company attributed uh, to Russia and consists of a client, including a kernel module or rootkit. Now, capabilities include file transfer and there's also a port forwarding tool. So your system could be used as a relay. And then of course, uh, there is also a command control capability built into this tool. Overall, the tool is modular. So there are various parts that could or could not be installed in your system if you are affected. And the document published by the NSA and FBI does include tons of technical details, including snort signatures and seek scripts to actually detect the activity. And a number of host-based indicators, uh, like, uh, for example, how to find it with volatility, Yara rules, and all kinds of additional details that in particular, if uh, you like to go hunting, well, uh, maybe some nice uh, new tools to try out. And well, this is it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.